Milking sure isn't what it used to be. Lights, fresh air, fast milking, even music. In fact, all farming has changed, changed a lot. Why, millions of farmers, and city folks too, can remember what farm life was like in the good old days. Well, let's go back to those good old days. Then, everything farmers had to do meant hard work from early morning until late at night. Doing chores never seemed to come to an end. Farmers used power, sure. Muscle power. Handling feed for the livestock was the same story. Long hours of backbreaking work. Hard work wasn't limited to the men folks. Farm women and children all had to pitch in to get the farm and household work done. Wood, chopped and split by hand, stoked the kitchen stove. Water came from the well. Johnny had to pump and pump and pump. Even feeding the poultry was no easy job. No wonder farmers and their wives grew old before their time. But hard work wasn't all. Most farmers didn't mind that too much. What bothered them more was that they got so little in spite of all their work. And what they got they had to spend right away to keep farm operations going or to meet mortgage payments. Many farmers sold out and moved to town or to other farm areas in the hope that they might do better. Some even lost their farms and had to move. Farm boys left home to hunt jobs in the city, even though it broke their parents' hearts. And the children, well, they couldn't understand why farm life was so different from city life. Mother, why can't we get an iron like this one? Well, honey, that's an electric iron, and we don't have electricity. Folks in town like Aunt Sarah have electric lights and irons. Can't we ever get some of those things? Can't we ever have electricity? Can't we ever have electricity? That was the big question on farms all over America. When farmers asked that question, they were told, it's too costly, it's impractical, or sometimes, you wouldn't use electricity much if you had it anyway. Each year, the question grew bigger and bigger. Each year, the need for electricity on the farm became more obvious. To increase efficiency, to lower operating costs, to meet the demands of an increasingly competitive marketing system. Farm organizations insisted that something be done. Lawmakers wrestled with the problem. American farms faced disaster. Electricity could be a big step in saving these farms. State and national leaders demanded action. And finally, there was action. In 1935, a rural electrification program was provided for by executive order signed by President Roosevelt under the Emergency Relief Act. Thus was created the Rural Electrification Administration, commonly known as REA. This was the start but very little happened. Rural electric lines were started in only a few areas. Rural America was still in the dark. Something else had to be done. In the Tennessee Valley area, farmers' electric cooperatives had begun to show a workable way. Congress acted in May 1936. The Norris Rayburn Bill made REA an independent agency to lend money at fair interest to private companies public power districts, and rural electric cooperatives to finance electric projects. All over America, farmers gathered in neighborhood meetings to discuss ways and means of putting this new idea to work. For many, it was just what they'd been waiting for. But for some, it appeared impractical or even impossible, sure to fail. All right, folks, let's take our seats and we'll get the meeting started. You fellows all know that this meeting was called to discuss the organization of a co-op to build electric lines out to our farms. Who wants to speak first? Well, I've been talking to some of my neighbors, and I know they all want electricity, but uh, I don't see how we farmers are going to build an electric line. 
I'm a farmer and not uh, an electrician. And uh, I don't know how we're going to know how to run a, an electric company. No, I, it's not going to work, that's all. No, no, you're wrong, Tom. I tell you, it won't work. You, Joe, what do you know about stringing up a wire? And Bill, you think you could ever make it to the top of a light pole? <laughs> <laughs> no, sir. I have my doubts about that. <laughs> yes, there were doubting Thomases. But for every Tom, there were many Harrys and Franks and Georges who believed the idea could work. They pointed out that they could hire competent men to plan and carry out construction and operation, just as cooperative creameries, elevators, and cotton gins had done. They could also depend on REA for expert advice and help. So, after much discussion... Tom says I can't climb a power pole. I guess he's right. But that won't keep me from getting electricity. I think us farmers can do anything we set our minds to, if we do it together. And that includes things that other people haven't done for us. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we start a cooperative so we can borrow from the government, and build our own electric lines. I think we are on the right track, and uh, I'll thereby second the motion. Well, Bill made a motion. Are you ready to vote? Let's vote. Let's vote. Okay, those who think we should start an electric co-op, raise your hands. Those against it? Motions carried. <laughs> now, before we go any further, let's have some nominations for an organizing committee. So America's rural electric systems were born. In true democratic fashion, farmers elected their own directors and officers. They signed up as members because they had faith in cooperation as a practical way to get things done, to get electricity. Many of them went from place to place getting other farmers to sign up until there were enough to meet REA's requirements. Committees went to work. They hired engineers to draw up plans and surveys. They figured out where their lines would be built and secured right-of-way agreements from property owners. They asked REA to help in planning and got it. They applied to REA for loans and they negotiated for purchase of electric power. These were busy days, active days. Many things to decide, many things to do, but the farmers got them done. There were unexpected obstacles. Some private power companies hurriedly built lines to skim the cream from the best rural areas. Sometimes private companies built lines, spite lines they were called, parallel to already constructed farmer-owned lines. In some cases, power companies refused to believe that the farmers were in the electric business to stay. Newly organized co-ops found it difficult to get power at rates they could afford to pay. In spite of many obstacles, actual construction got underway, in spite of delayed shipments and shortages of poles, wire, and equipment. Farmers saw for themselves that their faith and determination and their hard work were bringing results. As farm families watched, yard poles were put up, transformers hung, meters installed, the great moment had come. Electric lights began to go on all over rural America. In the home and in the farmyard, electricity began to help the farmer. Modern appliances and equipment replaced overworked arms and backs. Grandma didn't have to strain her eyes over her needlework. Electricity gave new enjoyment to all the family. When they saw their neighbors getting electricity, even the most skeptical farmers signed up to get the new wired hand. Even doubting Tom O'Connor signed up, at last. Rural electrification was gathering momentum. By late 1941, over half a million farms were getting electricity. Then... We interrupt this program to bring you the following news flash from Washington. Pearl Harbor in Hawaii has been attacked by Japanese bombers. Great loss of life is reported 
as well as destruction of many U.S. warships. President Roosevelt has called a joint session of Congress for tomorrow. We return you now to your regularly scheduled program. Thus, suddenly, grimly, America was plunged into war. Farm youth left their homes and families to enter the armed services. Upon the nation's farmers fell the heavy responsibility of supplying increased demands for food and fiber to strengthen the war effort. Men, women, and children pitched in. In spite of the short supply of farm labor, and because of farm mechanization and electrification, farm production met the demand. Electricity on the farm helped to fill the gap in farm manpower, helped to feed the world to win the war. Farmers were proud that they had done their job well. The millions invested in REA-financed rural electric lines had paid off. World War II had ended. But farm electrification had just begun. New uses were constantly being found for the new wired hand on the farm. Kilowatt hours doubled, tripled original estimates. Generating capacity could not keep up with demand. Heavily loaded lines meant low voltages, inadequate power for motors and lights. Where was more electricity coming from? Wholesale power suppliers strained to meet the demand both in the city and on the farm. Shortages of materials blocked construction of new generating capacity. Directors, managers, and engineers of rural power systems could get only part of the power they needed. Once more, farmers decided they could get what they needed by working together. In some areas, they built their own cooperative generating stations, their own transmission lines. These new farmer-owned facilities began to fill the gap, to deliver the power so badly needed they meant not only more electricity, they meant better service and lower rates. They also meant that farmers had their own yardsticks to measure the efficiency of producing power and setting rates. And this had its effect on the private power companies in many areas. They too improved their service and lowered their rates to better serve the growing farm market for power. Even in thinly settled areas where farms were far apart, they were connected up. Electricity for all farms, area coverage, has always been a basic principle of the movement. Each succeeding year, a larger percentage of the nation's farms had electricity. Now, more than nine out of ten of America's farms have electric service. Since the start of REA, a thousand rural electric systems have built over one and a half million miles of line. They serve more than four million farms and rural establishments over 14 million people. But the job is not finished, nor will it ever be. New farmhouses are always being built, new rural industries established. There are still rural areas that do not have electricity. There are still many more poles to set, many more miles of line to strain. Old lines must be replaced with new heavy-duty lines to meet ever-increasing power demand. New, more adequate, more efficient generation and transmission facilities must be built. The power of falling water has lowered the cost of electricity for thousands of people. Federal hydroelectric projects in the Tennessee Valley and elsewhere, such as Hungry Horse, Fort Randall and others, have and must continue to be developed to obtain maximum benefits of our natural public resources. These rivers are the nation's heritage our ability to harness them for power, irrigation, and flood control can benefit all of the people. The power of the atom must be harnessed and made available to everyone as the vital reserve and source of power for the future. Farmers everywhere are learning to improve farm efficiency by using electricity to do more of the farm chores. Electricity now pumps the water that flows down the rows of cornfields to increase their yield. Sprinkler systems can provide the moisture needed to assure a crop. Electricity helps dry crops such as corn or alfalfa. Electricity enables the farmer to handle larger herds, provides fast cooling for grade A milk production. Electricity means better, cleaner foods on the public market. Farm women are learning to use electricity in new ways to make their work more efficient and pleasant. Many families enjoy the comfort and convenience of electric cooling and electric heating in their homes. 
But having electricity is just the beginning. Just owning a rural electric system is not enough. Farmers know that active participation is the lifeblood of any democratic member-owned organization. They must attend their membership meetings where issues are debated, responsible directors elected, where decisions are made that will keep their organization strong and progressive. Strong local organizations, competently and efficiently managed, are the backbone of the rural electrification movement. But they do not stand alone. They work together to reach their goals. They have formed state associations and maintain central offices in most states, where professional staffs work continuously to provide safety, training, and educational programs, which increase the value of rural electric service. By group action, local systems save time and money in getting their jobs done. Every year, thousands of people, a cross-section from America's farms, take part in the annual meetings of the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association. They represent free enterprise business with investments of three billions of dollars. They represent an important market for American industry, and industry welcomes a chance to show them its products. The National Association was set up in 1942. Its purpose is to plan and promote national programs of action to protect what the farmers have achieved and to build for future progress. NRECA's board of directors, one member elected from each state, is a symbol of strength in unity, of democratic leadership. Special committees elected from NRECA member systems work on many problems of national significance. People give freely of their time because they realize they can achieve more working together than alone. The crowning of Miss Rural Electrification typifies the benefits of rural electricity to America's farm youth. To the extent of its resources, NRECA carries the message of the Rural Electrification Program to all corners of the nation. National and statewide publications, radio and TV programs, speakers and motion pictures keep millions of members informed and alert. These members depend on their state and national organizations to tell the true story of their rural electric systems. The story of local private enterprise in the truest sense, owned and controlled by the people, for the people it serves. These rural electric systems are paying back the money they borrowed from REA with interest, on or often ahead of schedule. And rural electric systems pay their share of taxes, federal, state, and local. In many counties and communities, they pay more property taxes than any other business. As a matter of fact, rural electric cooperatives paid over $11 million in taxes last year alone. The annual meeting of an electric association is an important event for its members. Of course, active members like Frank Andrews and his neighbors are present because they are in fact taking part in their own business. They help to decide how their business is to be managed. At any business meeting, there are reports to be made, questions to be answered, policies to be determined. You've heard your treasurer make his report. Are there any questions? Mrs. Brown. Mr. Chairman, the treasurer said we took in more money last year than it cost us to operate. I'm glad we have the net margin, but just what are we going to do with it? Can you tell us? We most certainly can, Mrs. Brown. In fact, our manager has prepared an illustration. Let's let him answer that for you. We had a good year, Mrs. Brown. You people use more electricity than ever before. In fact, your use of it has doubled in the last seven years. As your use of electric power increases, our gross receipts go up too. Here is our gross business last year. Now we're uh, talking about it on a cash basis. $541,603. Now this part is what it cost us to operate and pay our obligations, including the taxes that we pay and the principal and interest payments on our REA loans. When we subtract all these costs,
we have this amount. $39,500 left. That's our net margin. Now, uh, you ought to know how the board plans to use this money. That's right. Well, since this is the figure that you're interested in, let's just uh, erase all the others. First, we must keep in mind that this money is not profit. We must fix our rates high enough to be sure we take in more than we spend. Sound business requires that we have some money to set aside for emergencies. But it is your money. Remember that. It belongs to all you members. Now this is what we're talking about. This part that belongs to you. Your board of directors recommends that we divide this into two parts. The first part, $19,000. $500, they want to put into a reserve fund as an immediate source to meet emergencies, such as uh, sleet storms and for normal replacement. The other part of the net margin your board wants to use to make an advance payment on our loans from REA. By making these payments, we are replacing money that we have borrowed with our own capital, invested in our own electric system. It's a cushion against unforeseen future expenses which might make a future payment difficult. Do you uh, follow me, Mrs. Brown? Now one thing more. As our financial condition continues to improve, the board will put a plan in effect to return these net margins to you. Remember, this is a cooperative, a non-profit organization. Patronage refunds are part of a co-op's makeup. When we have the necessary cash reserves, we'll start returning the old margins to you as new margins come in. Does anyone else have a question? No questions. Thank you, Sam, for the explanation. Now can we have a motion to accept the treasurer's report? I move we accept the report. I second the motion. Motion made and seconded to approve the treasurer's report. All in favor of that motion, manifest saying aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. The motion's carried. Now what about the board's so that's the way it goes. The people's business run by the people to help themselves. But in helping themselves, they help everybody. They help the merchants on Main Street who supply the appliances and machinery modern farmers need. Farmers have spent four times as much for electrical appliances and equipment as the billions invested in their lines, poles, transformers, and generating stations. In addition, Farmers have become a vastly greater market for fertilizer, machinery, feed, and other necessities of farm life. Their purchases have kept assembly lines rolling to produce more goods. More industrial workers have had steady employment, more money to spend. Great basic industries of America have benefited from expanding rural electric systems. Iron ore to make steel, steel for substations and other structures, copper for many varied uses, Aluminum for wire that crisscrosses our countryside. Poles to carry the millions of miles of wire. Rural industries have been helped directly because rural electric systems have brought them low-cost, dependable power. Modern processing of food and fiber is now possible within the shadow of the farm itself, enabling local enterprise to expand and prosper. Increased farm income resulting from rural electrification has meant better schools, better roads, better communities. Electricity has also meant a better life, entertainment and relaxation. Farm life is finally catching up with city life thanks to rural electrification. Millions of poles like these, a million miles of line, have revolutionized American farming, have made modern farming possible. The power of electricity has replaced the muscle power of men and animals 
that has been the reliance of farmers throughout the ages. The American farms of today are products of a revolution in the application of science to agriculture. These modern farms are a tribute to the American farmers. Their determination has made the impossible come true. Rural electrification has made a better way of life for all.